All right, ladies and gentlemen, again, welcome to the Raisin Baseball Podcast, Season 1, Episode 2. We're here with Josh Young, one of the top prospects for the Texas Rangers. Big things coming this year for Josh, we hope, and uh, welcome. Thanks for having me. You bet, man. So why don't we uh, kick off, like, the experience of going through your youth playing baseball to get to where you are right now? Because I think a lot of people don't understand or know what type of dedication it takes and, and the things that are involved in becoming a, a first-round draft pick. You know, that, that alone is huge, but even getting through college, playing baseball is a big deal. Um, and then, you know, going to the next level to being a, a, a top prospect is, is huge. So if you could start us off, like, what's your history? How were you raised in baseball? What's your – how did it start? And take us all through your journey. Oh, man. So my journey is a long one. It started when I was two and a half years old. There was an ad in the paper for a baseball league on, like, the south side of San Antonio. Two and, and a half. Two and a half, and my parents got me in that. I think I ended up turning three, like, in the middle of the season, so it was, like, closer. But that's when I started T-ball was when I was two and a half. And I think the dedication came from my dad was a high school coach, varsity coach, head coach for a long time. And the only way that I would get soft toss when I was younger was if I did my drills off a tee into the net by myself before he got home. And that's the only way that I could get soft toss. And so that's what I did. I had to hit like three or four buckets before he got home in the garage. We had one of those big blue nets with the, the red rectangle right in the middle to hit. And obviously my bats were tiny, but that's where it all started it for me was in the garage. It was uh, 200, 300 balls off the tee. And the reward was? I would get flips from my dad. Okay. Because he was always coaching football, baseball throughout the year. And so I'd get home from daycare and I'd be like, okay, you have to get your swings in and you have to let me watch basically or else you don't get soft toss. So it was kind of like a reward. All right. And obviously it was time with my dad too. So I'd get those swings done. I'd go in the backyard and I'd have my imagination days where it was, you know, bottom of the ninth down, three bases loaded, three, two count, two outs. Am I going to be the hero? Throwing wiffle balls up to myself, trying to hit him over the fence. And so that's where my love and passion started and all began. And then I went through Little League until I was seven. Seven, I started playing coach pitch, competitively select baseball. And that's where the select journey began. Played, and then when you turn nine, kid pitch. So did your, did your father coach you all the way through? Was he always the coach on the team that you played for? <laughs> Little League, not as much. Once I got to coach pitch at eight, yes, he was my coach. When I turned nine, he gave up coaching, quit coaching so he could coach my brother and I, um, basically the way that he wished other people would have coached him when he grew up. Mm -hmm. So we were his project, basically. He wasn't going to coach anymore. He volunteered at the high school that I was going to end up going to, and he taught there. But it was no commitment to them. His full commitment was to us. And it's like, how can you ever be thankful for that? Because how many parents give up their dreams for their kids? Yeah. Not many. So he took us all over the country, spent literally our last dime sometimes just to get us to go places. And I remember the, the biggest trip we took was Cooperstown. That's the most expensive one for sure. We've actually passed on it because it was so expensive. <laughs> and, yeah, and so he just did so much for us throughout those times, and my mom too. Um, but they took us everywhere. We were never in San Antonio. We were always in Houston. Every weekend, we'd get home, you know, Monday mornings at 2 or 3 in the morning. But my parents were like, if this is going to be your commitment, if this is what you want to do in life, you got to get up and go to school. So when, when did you know this was your commitment? When did you know that this was the path for me? I just had so much fun doing it, honestly. And, you know, trying to get to the championship game, the competition, the competing, it was just fun for me. And... Being able to do it with my dad, I think, is what drove it, too, because it was, like, something we shared an interest in. And as a young kid, you don't really understand that, but you just feel it. And so I feel like it was just something for me, like, because he was a coach. My mom's a PE teacher, so it was like I had to be an athlete, right? Didn't really have a choice. Um, but his love is baseball, and I think he just passed that on to me from a young age. I just remember going to his games, and I would be dressed up in a baseball uniform at – two, three years old, standing outside the fence watching or getting a Gatorade bottle, throwing rocks up, trying to hit them over the fence behind the dugout and all kind of stuff. And then I don't remember, I think it was when I was, I turned seven or eight, I was just the bat boy 
all the time. So I was a bat boy from when I was seven or eight years old all the way up until I got into high school. So it was just, I just loved the game. And when I got into middle school, I had to get my homework done before I could go to practice. And once I got my homework done, I got to go practice with the high school team. So I had to rush home, get my homework done, because I walked to school. That's how close it was. And my mom worked at a school probably 25, 30 minutes away. So if I got done, got home, got my homework done, by the time she got home, I got to go to practice. And so it was just one of those things where they instilled school into me, but at the same time, it was like baseball was always my reward. So it was always fun, I guess. Yeah, something you always looked forward to, right? Yeah. So what type of – I mean, both your parents are educators. That was probably a huge, huge thing, right? Definitely. Education was before baseball. Education. So we always talk about our priority list. It's whatever you believe in, God, religion is number one, family is number two, academics was number three, baseball was number four, and then everything else fell into place after that. So it was always academics was pushed, and I think that's one of the biggest reasons I went to college was for my education. And so now I'm literally almost done with college. So it's like that's just an important thing for my parents is that I get my education and have that diploma as a backup plan if this doesn't work out. So, I mean, it's just – school was big to me too. I loved it. I loved doing it. My friends were good at school, so I wanted to be good, good at school. So – It's that competition regardless <sighs> of what the competition is. It didn't matter what it was. I'm going to compete with you. Like, I sit, I sit here and tell myself, oh, I have two classes left. It doesn't even matter anymore. Like, I'm just going to coast, just get it done. And then I, I find myself at the end of the class competing with myself to get that A, to get the highest grade I can, always. No matter how, at the beginning of the semester, I'm like, ah, it's just another, another class, no big deal. I'll just get a 70 or an 80, pass it, no biggie. I always find myself competing at the end. You know what? I'm getting that A. How can I get that A? If you're going to do it, do it all in. And I think that's where my competition nature really came out of me. It was video games with my brother when we were little. Everyone rage quit at some point. You're up big, brother rage quits, throws a fit. You're losing, you rage quit, you throw a fit. And so I remember we had the old Xbox. We played the old NCAA football games or NCAA baseball back. like They were like 05, 06 or something. And it was always a competition. Nonstop. Nonstop. Everything. We'd go in the front yard, play wiffle ball, and obviously he's younger than me, so I should beat him, right? But he's he's good because he has to keep up with me. Yeah, he's so, got fire on him too. So he's got that fire to beat me. So he beats me, runs around screaming, right? I beat him, so I want to run around and scream too. So it was just constant competition all the way throughout our childhood. And, I mean, it's still there. We play Fortnite, and it's who can get the most kills in the game. Like we're on the same team, but it doesn't matter. We're, we're <laughs> you know, always, always, always competing. And growing up, too, on Sundays, we would watch movies and play board games. That was, like, our family time when I got to high school because we weren't traveling as much during the baseball season or football season. So always a board game. Who could win? Who's going to win this week? Like, uh, the college bowl games come on. We always would pick them. Uh, would, would Jace cheat? Oh, Jace is the biggest cheater. Hey, finding a way to win, right? My mom will literally vouch for him. He'll stand up. The cards will fall out of his shorts. The dominoes will be between his legs. Like, it's ridiculous. It's so funny, though, uh, because a way to grind. he's going to find a way to win. Yep. And I don't know. You find a way to win, you find a way to win, right? So it's, it's pretty cool. It's pretty fun. But just the nature of it all. It's just a lot of fun. So, so you have that through through middle school. In high school, your father was coaching you on the school team or no? He was. He was still the volunteer assistant how, for my how team. How does that work? Because I've coached Tanner for, for years. And I think, you know, it's an interesting perspective. One, you're, you're a grown man, right? Uh, so you can reflect back on even those high school years or, or younger. And how was it to have your, co- your coach be your dad, your dad be your coach? There were some tough practices. Um, The expectations were high, and I think that's why I pushed myself to the hardest is because he put high expectations on me to come out there no matter what age I was and perform. And so I kind of put those expectations on myself now. But I'd say it's a blessing and a curse because the blessing part of it, you get to be with your dad. He gets to coach you. You get to share all those memories. The curse part of it, when you're having a bad day, you're going to get it worse. Mm-hmm. And the car ride home is going to be terrible, too. <laughs> but at the same time, it's, just, it's so much fun. 
it's definitely more of a blessing than a curse. There are there are those moments where it's going to be hard because of the expectations, but the expectations come through love. It's not coming to hurt you. He just wanted me and my brother to do the best we could, and so he took it personally if we were having a bad day because he's like, dang, did I do something wrong? No, it was probably just a bad day. Like As you learn in baseball, there's just going to be days where you don't got it. Right. But it's for him, it was like, okay, I want to teach them how to learn to get through those days regardless of how they feel because those days are going to happen and you have to have some kind of solution or something to tap into on those days to still try to be successful and not just fall down and give up. So what about uh, – tell me about the, the – college recruiting process so you've gone through high school how did you do in high school I hit decent in high school and I I was a decent pitcher okay but it was enough to get you looked at by Texas Tech okay so how does that conversation go where do you go when you first get contact with Texas Tech so I'd say the biggest thing is summer ball traveling around playing in big tournaments Uh, I never did really any perfect game showcases but we always played in the perfect game tournaments around the country. It's like almost being able to compare yourself to the best. Okay, the Evo Shield has the best team from the country, the best players in the country. How do we stack up? How do I stack up against those players? And so it was always cool to see, but that's where I got recruited. It was in Georgia at, I want to say it was the East Cobb Complex, when J. Bob Thomas, the recruiter for Texas Tech, saw me for the first time. And... I think the actual first person to see me was Ray Hayward, one of the coaches, saw me pitch Mm. for the first time. Called Jay Bob's like, hey, you got to go see this kid. And I ended up playing third or something the next game and had a few hit a few doubles. And they're like, okay, this kid can hit. What else can he do? So I got recruited as a two-way. But that process basically starts out, they contact your coach. They tell your coach, hey, we're interested in this kid. They get your information. They contact you. Recruiting so weird. There's dead periods where they can't talk to you. So there'll be times where you text them and they can't respond because it's a dead period. Right. And it, you start to feel, oh, this is kind of weird. Like we've been talking for a while and now we yes. can't talk. But it w- it's a fun process because you get to see who's interested in you. And it's always fun to have people interested in you. Texas Tech was my first offer and pretty much the first people that looked at me. Didn't know where Texas Tech was at the time. I knew it was in the Big 12 because I grew up a Longhorn fan. Um, I know everyone listening probably just cringed a little bit. <laughs> but I did grow up a Longhorn. Both my parents went to UT, and that's where I always wanted to go. But Texas Tech was my first look, my first offer, and I went up there, fell in love with the campus, and my atmosphere at Texas Tech was small, which was good for me. I had the baseball field. I had the tutoring center right next to the baseball field, the lunch area right next to the baseball field where he worked out right next to the baseball field. My life was right there other than walking to class, which was like a 10, 15-minute walk, walk back, and your day's over. So I think all of that encompassing kind of made me choose Texas Tech. But from the recruiting process, you kind of just talk to them and figure out, like, how interested they are in you. Um crazy thing was my visit was actually on my bye week in football my junior season so on our bye week we drove up to Texas Tech to see them we get out of the truck on the back of my dad's truck is a Longhorn emblem so coach Tadlock and all the coaches you know get out of their little golf cart come walk over and I'm standing in front of the logo because I don't want them to see it right but Tadlock walks to me and goes oh you're tall (laughs) <laughs> I was like, uh, yeah, a little bit. And he's a little bit shorter guy. So in my head, I was like, oh, yeah, you're kind of short, too. But um, anyway, good guys. And so they take you around campus. They show you around. They show you academics. Either they the coaches are taking you around or coaches. Students, uh, coaches. Yeah, coaches. Coaches take you around on your unofficial visit and show you basically, like, what it would be like if you're on campus. And they're like, okay, what are you interested in studying? So I've always been into communications. I've always loved MLB Network ever since it came out, I guess, something like that. And I've always wanted to work for them, which is like like the 1% of the 1% of the 1% of the 1% because you got to play baseball to, you know, be an analyst for MLB Network. So it was just kind of all my goals kind of line up playing baseball. But anyway, so communications is my deal. So they took me through the communications college. They took me around, showed me what it would be like if I worked. 
and went through that college. So the whole process is fun because the whole time they make you feel loved throughout the process. I wanted to commit on the spot because they have a board at Texas Tech. So when you commit, you sign the board. And so one of the things, every time there's a commitment, Coach Tadlock will tweet out, put it on the board. And so, like, it's a big deal to, like, sign the board. But my parents were like, no, we're not letting you commit on the spot. We're going we're gonna to take some reflection time to make sure we make the right decision here before we go forward. And this is at, at your senior year? Or my junior year. Okay, your junior year. And so it took, I don't know if it was a week, two weeks later, um, my parents were like, you got to do research, find pros, cons. We want, you want to know what you're dealing with before you go into it. And so, like, with Tadlock, they're like, okay, he's a great dude. What are good things? What are bad things? With the program, good things, bad things. There was no bad things, honestly. We looked into it. We tried to figure it out. And Tadlock is just an amazing guy. He's a great coach. We've, we've had the benefit of being able to talk to a bunch of college players and you can get them away from college when they're graduating and there's nothing or graduated and there's nothing for them to, you know, fear at all. Yeah. You get the true story. And there's a lot of coaches that you think are like really good guys that you hear all these horror stories after the fact. So it's awesome to hear that, you know, Coach Tadlock was, he's the man. He's, he's the real solid. deal. And one of the big things for me is I like to swing the bat. I like to go up there and hit. Tadlock's philosophy is go hit. We're going to bunt if we need to late in the game, but the game's yours. Go play. And he basically gets out of your way. He lets you hit the way you want to hit. There's no philosophy of hitting. It's one of those things where, like, if you're struggling, you go to them and ask them, hey, can you work with me on something? What do you see? It's not them standing there hawking your every move, and that's just something that I loved about it. Mm -hmm. I could go in there. I can create my own routines, and I could do my own thing, and it was just a lot of fun to be able to do that. And – I don't know. I just I just love that feeling, and they don't have any deals with gloves or bats or really anything. They just use Under Armour clothes, and they're like, you know what? Use whatever you're comfortable with. Swing whatever you like. If it's not working for you, go pick something else. And I I just love that about it, and that's some of the reasons I chose Texas Tech. All right, so we're in Texas Tech. Talk about the uh, the College World Series. <sighs> There is nothing like the pinnacle of college baseball. That is the most fun atmosphere you could ever be around. You get you get the uh, butterflies in your stomach getting off the bus, or <sighs> what do you got? What I you get butterflies. You're like you. We know you're going to the the College World Series. Everyone's jazzed and hyped up about that. But when you actually walk through the stadium, what what happens at that point? So, for me, it, that dream started in 2005 when I was eight. We went to the College World Series. Remember, we were Longhorn fans. We went to the College World Series following UT, and they ended up winning it. And so that kind of sparked my dream of, or goal of winning the College World Series and getting there. And that was in Rosenblatt back in the day. I think there was only two games that entire tournament that we missed, and they were Nebraska games because, obviously, Nebraska's where the College World Series is and all their fans come pretty much buy all the tickets. We probably missed two games out of the whole thing. And it, the atmosphere was just incredible. Like, LSU wasn't even in the World Series, and they traveled and had fans travel. So it's just that experience alone is nothing like anything else. Like you can go to World Series games, but, like, tailgating in college sports is just something else. Because people bring all kinds of food. They're like, hey, come try this. And you're just like, yeah, all the tents that are set up, all the, you know, baseball baseball merchandise it's just cool to see like all these companies that you've never really heard of or seen and they got some cool gear and you want to wear it and you just go pick it up and it's just the whole experience with it is fun so that started in 05 I think I went back three more times as a fan uh, I got to see the first maybe it was the first world series at Ameritrade maybe the second but anyway there's a tournament there called the slump buster in Omaha and you get to go see a game or two being in the tournament so that sparked it just being able to be around that atmosphere I was like this is where I want to be like a lot of kids are like oh, I want to play professional baseball I'll go out of call go out of high school but mine was like I want to play in the college world yeah, series it's something that has to be checked before it's, it's on the on. bucket list of my baseball careers I want to play in Omaha so getting off the bus that first time for practice I was super nervous anxious I was like oh my gosh I've actually made it as a player here 
because my freshman year we lost. We were ranked fourth in the country, lost in our own regional because I slid past third base oh. in the seventh inning. Hold the tag. Tough deal. I'm not going to talk about it. But um, so after that season, I was like, oh, my gosh. We were so good, and yet we lost in our own regional at home to San Houston State. So we would have hosted Florida State the next week, and we probably would have beat them because our team, I'm not kidding, was ridiculous. And then we probably would have made it to the World Series. Maybe not have won it, but we would have made it. Let me ask had you, a chance. what's the conversation after that game in the clubhouse? Because how many, I'm sure you had plenty of players that were going to stick around for the next year. You, you have that loss. You know how good you should have been, you could have been, you were. Is there disappointment or is there fire of like, no, let's start rebuilding right now to go kick them in the teeth? Both. For sure both because we had a lot of seniors, upperclassmen that were leaving not coming back. that weren't coming back. So it was emotional. But at the same time, I think we all needed some reflection time before being like, all right, we're going to go get it. Because after that season, your gut checked right then. Like you get smacked in the gut. You're on your knees. How are you going to respond? Well, for the guys that aren't coming back, they're either going to go pay – go play professional baseball they're going into the real world so that their gut check's different than the gut check of the guys coming back for me I was like okay I never want this feeling ever again there was a picture of me standing out in front of the dugout after we lost because we were in all gray I think I'm just standing there just watching the other team dog pile on our field and that was my screensaver for the longest time because I was like I never want to have this feeling again in your own house in our own house Losing the last game of the season never feels good. It doesn't matter what level you're at. Never feels good. So that was just my motivation to go out there and get after it. And I feel like our whole team had the same motivation. Like, you know what, we're going to get better. It's like go off to summer ball, get better. Come into the fall, get stronger, get faster, get better. How are we going to do that? Now at this level in college, with the guys that are returning, you see them. You know you guys talk during the summer. We are – going to do this is that where's there a cohesive hey we're going to go and we're going to make another run and we're going to be even better and there's nothing that's going to stop us because you know we talk about like the last dance with Michael Jordan Michael Jordan talks about rebuilding and and he got everybody together and there's quite a few teams that make these long championship runs in football and basketball and baseball where they grab x players you know for for basketball it's getting four players five players together and just working together again did any of that happen after that time? Did you know everyone was working in the offseason? It was pretty much the common theme was, what are you willing to sacrifice to get to our goal? It didn't happen last year. What are you willing to give up this year for the team to get there this time? How is it going to work? And I think that's where that fall, yeah, we still had our fun. We still you know, did our thing off the field. But when it was time to get after it, it was like a switch was flipped and everything was intensified. And everything was just, you know, more intentional with our actions and with what we did. And we came out and banged my sophomore year. And it was just fun to be a part of. And I think that's what it takes, honestly, like you said about those teams, is is what are you going to sacrifice? What are you willing to give up to be able to reach that goal? That? So me and my dad came up with this little wristband idea. Sacrifice with commitment equals the College World Series. So it was like – SWC equals CWS, so it was just kind of like flipped. And so I, we had wristbands made, and we gave them out to the whole team, and it was like, it's on your wrist every day. What are you willing to sacrifice? And so, I don't know, it was just it was just super cool to be a part of. Absolutely. It was honestly so much fun. And so that you run. You sit there, and you're like, man, we came so close, especially in your own house, right? <sighs> and so having that idea of, of coming back and not being like, oh, we're, 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 we could have done so much. We should have, would have, could have. Yep. Turn the page. And so being able to refocus your energies, I think, is a huge deal. So you have that year. The following year, you guys did. We made it. Finally. We beat, uh, we beat Duke in the Super Regionals to make it. But I think it's like, like after that season, hindsight's always twenty twenty. You're going to sit there and be like, oh, I could have done this. I could have done that. But like you said, if you refocus your energy and be like, you know what? this is where I need to improve and this is how I'm going to improve. It's just like a building block to get you to the next step that you're trying to get to because you can shoot a could have would all day long. Oh, I should have slid earlier. Oh, I should have slid 
or I should have slid head first and hooked the bag instead of sliding feet first and trying to grab it with my hand after I passed it. There's all those kind of things, all those thoughts that go into your head. But it's like, how quickly can I get over that and refocus my energy and be like, you know what, this is what I'm going to do to get to where I really want to go. And so, yeah, the next year we ended up beating Duke in the Supers. That was an interesting series and made it to Omaha where we had to play the number one Florida Gators right out of the gate. And I think we were ranked eighth that year. And it was just like, all right, now we're here. We don't want to just be here. Texas Tech had made it to the World Series twice before. First year, it was 0-2 in a barbecue, see you later. Next year, they won one game, got knocked out. So it was like, okay, how can we be different? How can we be special? Well, we take on Florida, and we beat them in game one. That the landmark for Texas Tech. They start 1-0 and in Omaha. Then we lost two straight to Arkansas and then Florida. <laughs> Wait, did we lose to Florida? We lost to Arkansas. They smacked us around. And then I think we did lose to Florida. Anyway, um, so it was like, how are we going to keep progressing as a team? Because now we've made it. This three, three out of four years, or three out of five years, we've made it to Omaha. Now how are we going to get that next step? How are we going to finish it? How are we going to come in and finish the deal? And so I feel like that's just the energy now in the clubhouse. is like Omaha's expected. How are we going to get that title? How are we going to bring it home to Lubbock for the first time? And I think that's what's continued. Um, and I know Corona didn't have – or Corona happened last year, so there's no season. But I think that's what we see now in the Lubbock locker room. It's like, all right, Omaha's expected. We're going to get there. How are we going to win it this yeah, time? Winning is contagious and losing is contagious. The mindset of a winner, the mindset of a loser – they're contagious, so be careful where you channel your energy. It's crazy because with Corona happening, most of the guys in that clubhouse only know Omaha because we went twice in a row. So those freshmen, my sophomore year, have been twice in a row. The freshmen the year after that have been once. Last year, nobody went to Omaha. So that's all they know is Omaha, pretty much the whole team. So, all right, Omaha's expected – how are we going to win it? And I think that's the mindset they have right now. And it's it's just cool to go up there, work out with those guys, and see that energy. You can see the fire still. You can right? see you've, it. You've left the camp. You've come back to the camp, but you still see the fire still. still Definitely. Running. That's huge, man. So what about getting drafted into the MLB with the Rangers? What was that like? What do you got for that? Like, how <sighs> did you know? When did you know? What did you know? This is the full – Detective with me, like, what do you got? How'd that all roll about? So the draft process is special because, again, everybody's interested in you, or some teams are interested, some teams aren't. But it's always great to feel wanted, right? Yeah, being pursued, yeah. And so I had that process a little bit in high school. Um, teams were interested. You have to fill out questionnaires. You have to do all these vision tests, all this kind of stuff. And it's just fun because you're like, oh, my gosh, like this, this could be a thing, right? Go through it in high school, so I got a taste of it. College – different animal now now you're older your leverage isn't as much and you've been through it before so it's kind of you know kind of what to expect and so now in college it's more of like I feel like it's more personal because you know what they're looking for like at the end of the day they're looking for the guy on the field but they try to get to know the guy off the field too they want that personality that fits their profile and right. they think is a champion yeah so it all, it all comes back to who are you off the field, and that's where I got wait, 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 Say that one more time. It all comes down to who you are off the field. Off the yep. field. Because mm-hmm. everyone's a stud. Everybody's they, a stud. A, stud, a stable of studs, and what's going to weed out. You've all become epic vision guys. You become your, your, your nutrition's awesome. Your work ethic's awesome. Everyone's there. And what that deciding factor is, what the big thing is, is who you are off the field. Off. Your talent's going to take you far. Talent will take you in this game. But what keeps you there is the kind of person you are, how you handle failure, how you deal with failure, how you deal with setbacks, and also how you deal with success, honestly. It all comes down to that. And in those interviews you go through, they, ju- they just talk to you and try to figure out who you are. And so, like, I'm an introvert. I love to do everything by myself. I like to have my space. I like to have my time. Um, I have a mini basketball hoop I shoot on probably two hours a day. And, you know, it's just, it's just something I do right. because it, you know, it's something I love. 
but they just try to figure out who you are. And so it's, it's kind of fun to see what kind of habits you develop over time, good or bad, because you can learn from everything, right? Mm -hmm. Like my mental conditioning coach is Brian Kane, and I've been working with him for a long time. And then we personally got connected, or I did his videos for a long time. I personally got connected with him my sophomore year of college. And, you know, the biggest thing drilled in my head as a kid was what's important now. So it's an acronym, WIN, W-I-N, what's important now. Um, and then pride, personal responsibility, and daily excellence, all kinds of stuff. Just basically, like, routine out your day. You're going to do this at a certain time. You're going to do this at a certain time. You're going to do this at a certain time. And it, it almost becomes a checklist, but it's also keeping you in time, keeping you in rhythm as to what you're doing so that way you don't waste time. And what's the, So it's time management. Basically. Time management is huge. You have a checklist of things that you need to click off during the day. Mm -hmm. And then at the end of that checklist is what? Free time reward. Yeah, basically. Like there's going to be free time throughout your day, but it's like, okay, I know I got to get this done. I know I got to get this done. I know I got to get this done. This, not as much, but I'm going to put it on here just in case. And it's like, okay, how disciplined can I be on a daily basis? And it's my biggest thing. My word of the year two years ago was discipline. My sophomore year was discipline. I wrote it on a little plank piece of wood, wrote it out, put it in my room. So that was my word of the year. And that drove everything I did, was how disciplined could I be in my actions. And it changes your life, honestly, when you're able to – you just feel better. You have self-worth. Like, there's nothing that can stop you, honestly, because that's integrity. That's what you're doing. That's, you know. And that's in life, man. That's yeah. not just sports. That's yeah. the thing is, like, people don't, people don't understand. Kids don't understand. Some parents don't understand. Adults don't understand. If you have a goal and a checklist, be it a long-term goal, a short-term goal, a medium-term goal, the idea of, of achieving that is a huge reward for you personally, your mind, your body, your soul. Because it's rewarding. It's something that you've chased. And then now you readjust your sights to go, I've come this far, but I didn't come this far only to get this far. Right. So one of the things that Brian King talks about is a staircase. At the top of your staircase is your long-term goal. Now you're going to work backwards and figure out how you're going to get there as far as you want to. It can be as many steps as you want, and it turns into your short-term goals and how you're gonna, how are you going to get there and be successful every day in your goals. It's about what getting 1% better. It's about winning the day. 1% better. Little... It's funny because I, I give an analogy to Tanner about like you're putting a, you're putting a piece of paper into a book, right? Alone, a piece of paper tears very easily. It's very fragile, but when you put page after page after page, year after year, 365 over 10 years, you now have a phone book that is not rippable. Right. It's so strong. Yeah. So it's it's huge. It's yeah, and that's where I really started to dive into my faith because I was like, you know what? I love baseball, but I really don't want it to define me off the field. Like, I don't want my away from the field life and baseball to be, you know, together, joined. Mm -hmm. Because I don't want it to dictate my actions. Like, you know, baseball is what I do, but it's not who I am. Right. I wanted my, my identity to be in something better, and I chose to put it in Christ. And I fail with that all the time. I'm not the best with it, but I, you know, I try every day. But... I feel like there's got to be some kind of escape from baseball because it's a game of failure. You fail seven times out of ten and you're a Hall of Famer. You're going to go to the park and you're just not going to have it. You're not going to have the feel. So it's like, okay, when I step across those white lines, who am I? Am I going to go home and be depressed that I had a bad day? Or am I going to go home and be a human? Be grateful that you had the opportunity to run, jump, play this game. and Exactly. Things to be definitely good. And that's one of the big things Kane and I talk about too is what are you what's your gratitude? What are you what are you looking at and what are you thankful for on a daily basis? That just changes your outlook on everything. Because there was a time my first professional season where I was like 0 for 25. Never happened to me in my life. But I was 0 for 25 and I was like, I can't figure this out. How does this happen? I don't know. I don't know what to do. I'm going in the cage every day early. I'm tinkering with my swing but it wasn't even really about that it was all mental and like I pride myself on you know not letting baseball define me but there's times where you're going to fail with that and I was letting baseball define me I was going home I was super upset I was trying to watch film and it was consuming me to the point where like I was depressing myself because I wasn't performing and I was basing my attitude 
on my performance. And you're probably just digging through film going like, that's, I, I got to figure it out. I got to figure it out. And then you start, you nothing. literally in your mind start putting things there that aren't even there. Mm -hmm. You're like, oh, my back elbow's moving. It's not moving at all. I'm striding too far. You're striding an inch. And so like you start making things up to justify what's going on. But really what I've learned and what Kane talks about is take a step back, breathe, focus on your breath. Don't focus on the game. Just have fun. Yeah, your swing is Be thankful game. for something. Be a good teammate. Go out there and hype them up when you're struggling. It's easy to sit on the bench and be like, you know, pity party of one. Mm. But you stand up and you're, you know, happy for your teammates. You're going to feed off their energy at some point. And when you're going good, pick your teammates up. They're going to feed off your energy. And so, I don't know, he calls it bringing the juice. How much juice can you bring on a daily basis? <laughs> Michael's like secret stuff. <laughs> um, but he talks about bringing the juice. How much juice can you bring on a daily basis? Because people are going to feed off your juice, positive or negative. Mm -hmm. You bring a bad vibe, people are going to have a bad vibe. You bring a good vibe, people are going to, you know, get on that train and have a good vibe with you. <sighs> I don't even remember what the original question was at this point, but <laughs> we're, we're rambling. Talking about, we're talking about getting drafted. And the oh. Of being drafted. <laughs> Oh, but no, this is all really, really great stuff, man. And I think it's important because so many people don't understand like the building blocks, the building blocks. It's not like you woke up one day and said, I'm an elite baseball player because you wanted to be an elite baseball player. I want to be an MLB ball player. Well, guess what? Playing Fortnite 24 seven isn't going to make you be that. Right. And there's so many guys that have big time dreams with a small time work ethic. It's the small steps daily that I think get you to where you want to go. Yeah. It's what action, what, um, intentional action can I have today to help me out? It doesn't have to be much. Get get a tennis ball. Go outside 30 minutes. Throw it against the wall. Field it. Something. Something. It doesn't have to be, oh, I got to go to the batting cage. I got to go to the field. No. Get a lacrosse ball. Get a, a racket ball. Something. Go outside. Just throw it against the wall. It, the art or the, the use of imagination is so powerful, I think. Like when you're a kid, you dream of all this stuff that you want. As you get older, your dreams will change. But it's like the the return to innocence is probably one of the biggest non talked about success stories there is because when you're able to use your imagination and when you're able to see it in your mind, your mind can't differentiate between what is real and happening and what you envision. So if you can sit down or go outside and just imagine yourself, put yourself in situations to where, you know, you're in a tight ball game. How, how can you breathe? How can, what do you smell? What do you taste? What are you feeling when you get in the box, when it's a tough situation? And you can imagine all of this and put yourself in that position. And when it happens in real life, you're the, you've been there. It's not some new uncharted territory. You've been there. You can do it. You've been through it. You've envisioned your success. And I think that's, one of the most important aspects of my game is my meditation, um, visualizing success routine. And, you know, Kane and I talk about it, and I know I talk about Kane a lot. We're close, and it's like, okay, you envision yourself having success. And he's talking to me about right now putting together a highlight reel from my career and watching it. And I think Bauer, Trevor Bauer does the same thing where he's got, like, every strikeout from when he was fr at UCLA until now in a video. And it's, like, forever long, just him punching people out. And it's, like, that stuff will hype you up. Even in the times where you're upset, like, you're going to feel that energy. You're going to be like, yep, I was there. I still get goosebumps going back and watching Kurt Wilson's three-run homer to send us to the World Series my junior year. Every time he hits it, and I hear, it's more than a pop-up, it's a big fly. I get goosebumps every time. And it's like seeing those moments, feeling those moments, envisioning those moments. There's nothing more powerful than that. So I'll tell you what's, what's really interesting, and I think Tanner will probably say the same thing. Over the past few weeks, the one common thing that we keep hearing is like focusing, like having your brain vision, visualize what you want to happen. We were in the cages with, with Rafael Palmero last week. He said the same thing. He's like, what I do is I close my eyes and I, I visualize you know, what's, what my at-bat is, what my strategy is, what I saw, how I saw it, what I did, what I need to do, all that stuff. John Buck, in the podcast that we did with John Buck from Behind the Dish, he talks about like sit on your edge of your bed 30 minutes before you go to sleep so you can 
dream about what you just put into your brain. You know, smell it. Smell the field. Smell the grass that's just been cut. Feel the leather of your glove. Feel the, the ball. And, you know, it's interesting. That's the common theme is that everyone that has played this game at a high level that we've talked to in depth is that's something that's never talked about but is almost always done. And I think one of the biggest things, too, is we always talk about embracing failure. I think we have to embrace the moment more than failure because, yeah, you can learn from failure. You're going to learn more from a failure than you are from success. But I feel like our world is so fast-paced, social media, all that kind of stuff. It's how, how can you slow down and live at the pace of life? Um, Nico Iyer on a calm meditation master class, embracing stillness, talks about slowing down. Walk the same route every day. What do you notice that's different? What do you smell that's different? Slow down. Because in baseball, it's easy to speed yourself up. Mm -hmm. Guys are going to be gassing you up, throwing 100 miles an hour. How can you slow down? Slow your brain down and be like, I'm right here in the moment. I'm, like Coach Tadlock always says, be where your feet are. I'm where my feet are in this moment. I'm not thinking about two pitches ahead. I'm not thinking about the error I just made or the punch out my last at bat. I'm thinking about right here, right now. How can I do this? How can you be there? And the biggest common theme is going to be your breath. Breathe. Focus on your breathing. You focus on your breath, you're going to be in the moment. You can't think about anything else. Yeah, things slows down, calms down. Yeah, and so Ryan Holiday, um, who writes a lot of books for stoicism and being a stoic, has like three books, The Obstacle is the Way, um, Ego is the Enemy, and Stillness is the Key. And it's like, how can you be in the moment as long as you can? How can you be right here today, all day long, Get your stuff done and be in the moment and be intentional with your actions. Tomorrow is going to come. Yesterday's over. What can you do today to be successful? That's all that matters. And that's that 1% better we were talking about is if you can be here today and you can do everything here today, you're going to be successful because you are locked in. And it's just intentional. Favorite segment I've done this and I think every single interview I've ever done Favorite segment. I'm basically going to ask you uh, a yes or no or a like either or question, and you got to choose. So the first one is texting or talking. Talking. Okay. Favorite day of the week. Friday. Friday. For me, it's Wednesday. <laughs> Wednesday's always been my hump favorite day. day. Hump <laughs> day. Weird, Probably right? because of hump day. Things of a camel. I know. <laughs> uh, favorite city in the U.S. besides the one you live in. Lubbock. Lubbock. I mean, don't, I guess you don't live there. I grew up in San Antonio. I live in Lubbock now, but I would say uh, probably Dallas because that's where hopefully I'll play one day. Hopefully. Coming up here pretty soon. Uh, nickname your parents used to call you. Six. Six. Number six. Hence, hence number six. Uh, last song you downloaded or listened to? Oh, Somebody's Problem, Morgan Wallen. All right. Would you rather be able to speak every language in the world or be able to talk to animals? Uh, I don't know. I, I want to talk to animals. <laughs> animals, baby. Uh, favorite holiday? Christmas. Of course. Uh, ketchup or mustard? Neither. What? Neither. <laughs> right, ketchup, mustard, or relish? Neither. <laughs> None of them. Yeah, I am maybe. plain Jane. You go burger, I go meat, cheese, and bacon. It's and that's it. Nothing. And bun. Uh, scale of 1 to 10, how good of a driver are you? 10. All right. Best there that is. Like, duh. Um, let's see. How long does it take you to get ready every day? Like, how long does it take <laughs> Five seconds. I know, dude. I feel like the girls take forever. The guys. Oh, my gosh. Don't forever. even get me started. Um. Fill in the blank, Taylor Swift is? Good. All right. <laughs> uh, what age do you want to retire? From baseball. Yeah. <laughs> Never, hopefully. Um, Stay in the game for yeah, as long as I can. I want them to retire me. How about that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you have to tell me to leave. Get out. Uh, invisibility or super strength? Super strength. Super strength. Captain America, duh. Uh, is it... Wrong for a vegetarian to eat animal crackers. <laughs> that's just, that's a tough, <laughs> tough question, but no, it's not. <laughs> I think you're right. Uh, a scale of 1 to 10, how good are you at keeping secrets? Mm, not very. Same. Ooh. Same. Lock him in. Uh, first celebrity crush. 
Anna Kendrick. Anna Kendrick. That's pretty strong. Uh, morning or night? Morning. If you could travel back in time, what period would you go to? Ooh, that's a hard one, but I'd have to go to the 40s to see Jackie Robinson play. 40s. Ooh, 42. Uh, place you most want to travel? To? Yeah. Oh, I mean, I love Cooperstown. I love going there. But if we're talking out of the country, too, Greece or Rome. Greece. Uh, favorite junk food? I know you don't eat a lot of it, but... Chex Mix. Chex Mix. Chex Mix. That's as deep as it's it goes. It's considered junk food. It's junk food is Chex Mix. <laughs> Listen up, kids. Junk food is Chex Mix. And fruit snacks, uh, I guess. Say a word in Spanish. Hola. <laughs> Hola. Do you snore? Or que lo que? Do I, do I snore? I breathe very deeply. Very deeply. <laughs> Not snoring, very deeply. Um, let's see. Look in here. Have you ever worn socks with sandals? If you're a baseball player, you have to. All the time. I wore socks and sandals to the field every single day in college. Yeah. I mean, you got to. Uh, would you rather cuddle, cuddle with a baby panda or a baby penguin? Panda. Panda. Good cuddle, buddy. Penguins uh, stink. <laughs> you ever I been to the zoo? I oh, goodness. Um, let's see. Name one of the seven dwarfs. I can't. Exactly, I can't either. Cake or pie? Cake all day. I do not like pie. All right. Godfather or Star Wars? Star Wars. Have you seen The Godfather? I have. It's, it's pretty good. Two's okay, three's terrible. Star Wars is amazing. Star Wars is very good. All right. Hang on, one more. You got one more? One more. How many times do you sneeze? Or hang on, how many times did you sneeze in the last seven days? <laughs> I have no idea. Uh, maybe one or two. I don't know. <laughs> All right. You had to stop it for that one. All right, hang on one more. Big dogs or small dogs? Small dogs. Oh, you ruined it. I have a mini schnauzer back home. She is the schnauzer. cutest thing ever. Schnauzer. What's the dog's name? Shotzi. Shotzi. Sh Sweetheart schnauzer. in German. <laughs> All right. Ooh. So that is Josh Young, prospect with the Texas Rangers. Appreciate you coming out here on the Raisin Baseball Podcast. Thank you for having me. This is a lot of fun. So thanks so much, brother. Yep. Thank you guys. Appreciate it. Appreciate it.